Turn your Bibles tonight to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This is a familiar passage of scripture to most Bible readers and the Apostle Paul was rejoicing in the Lord and he uh, recommended that uh, God's people also rejoice in the Lord. And in verse 6 he said, be careful for nothing, or that is be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I for us tonight to think about a sound mind. A sound mind. He <clears throat> began in verse 6 by telling us what he's saying in so many words. Is, Don't worry. And I know that uh, that's a tall order for we who are in human flesh not to worry. Because that's one of the things that uh, we... Uh, seem to find ourselves doing from time to time. But yet, Paul admonishes us instead of worrying in everything by prayer and supplication and to always give thanks unto God let your request be made known unto God. Scripture teaches us casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. And certainly that uh, I believe Paul did that in, in his life. I know that uh, he was just a man as other men are. But he also relied upon God for his help and his strength. In fact, he made a down in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In verse 7, as he spoke about the peace of God, and he said it would not only just be the peace of God, but it would be the peace of God that would pass all understanding. It would be even greater than we could imagine, even greater than we could comprehend. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, we must have faith in order to not be anxious. In Romans 14, in verse 23, Paul said, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And when we diligently seek him, that means that we are emptying ourselves of our dependence upon ourselves and looking to God for the help and strength that we need. And so, as he said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Uh, I know that uh, sometimes we want to see with our natural eye things come to pass that uh, we've asked God, but uh, the scripture teaches us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so that we do not trust him by sight, we trust him in faith. And of course that as we trust him in faith, we know that uh, the faith we have from the Lord to be saved is not the only type of faith that's taught in the Bible. We must serve him by faith. We must live by faith and then we must die in faith. And of course, death to a child of God uh, is not something that is, is to be feared. It's something that uh, we should feel the very peace of God in our hearts and in our minds when it comes time for us to leave this world. And Paul had that in his life. He knew that he had uh, finished that course that God had for him. 
that he was ready to go to be with the Lord. And when it comes time for us to leave this world as a child of God, uh, that uh, he'll give us the faith and he'll give us the mercy and the grace that we need to make that crossing to the other side. Now, we must look unto our Savior if we're to have a sound mind. Now, we're living in a world that is filled with chaos. In a world that is uncertain. In a world that's certainly not steadfast. We're living in the midst of an evil and perverse nation as the Bible mentions. And it's not just this nation, but the nations of the world that uh, have uh, been flooded with evil. And evil is not something that just began today. Evil has been here since the very beginning of the history of mankind. And man has had to deal with it all down through the generations of mankind. And it's going to be here as long as this world stands in its present condition. And this little skirmish that's going on in the Middle East, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Because these battles have been going on since Abraham's day. And what it's all, if you don't know what it's all about, all those Arab nations want to destroy Israel and take the land. That's what it's all about. And uh, so Israel has to defend herself. She's surrounded by enemies. And it goes back to Abraham and uh, Sarah and uh, Sarah giving her handmaid uh, to Abraham and uh, he having a child by her and that he was not the promised seed. And so there's been that friction between the Arabs and the Jews all down uh, since Abraham's day and it's going to continue on. And so when you see these skirmishes flare up, uh, don't uh, become uh, fearful and afraid, but rather uh, look to the Lord for uh, your uh, soundness of mind, for your calmness of spirit, because the Lord certainly is able to help us with that. But in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I want to turn over there and read it, lest I leave out a word or two. Uh, in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, beginning in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. That's tall order, isn't it? The things in this life that weighed us down, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Folks, we're in a race as God's children. We're in this race of life. And we're running a race of endurance as children of God. And as we run this race, as he instructs us in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That we can't complete this race without him. That we must have his power, we must have his strength, or, or we'll falter along the way. Uh, we'll, we'll fall out. Uh, we'll not lose our salvation, but... Uh, we will certainly miss many blessings if we don't finish this race with courage, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. When you think everything is going wrong with you, think about what happened to Jesus. Think about his betrayal in the garden. Think about his mockery of a trial. Think about the stripes that were placed upon his back. Think about the accusations that were made against him. Think about his being nailed to the cross and his suffering and his pain. Think about all these things, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He could look in the future and he could see uh, the result of what he was doing. That sinners could come to know Christ as their Savior uh, and that's what kept him on the cross 
was that joy that was set before him. And you say, well, how could a man have joy in the midst of all that pain and suffering? Well, how can we as God's children, when we're going through the midst uh, of pain and suffering in this life, uh, how can we have joy in our heart? Because of that that's set before us. That that's coming in the future. That that we're going to enjoy when we cross to the other side. And what a blessing it is to know that this can give us the soundness of mind that we need. We have to have a hunger to live a righteous life. Have you ever heard the old saying, put your whole heart into it? And I can sum it up in this way. I don't know how many times I heard when I was growing up, my mother made this statement, son, whatever you do, do it well with all your heart. Put your whole being into it. And that's what we're to do for our Lord because he gave his life a ransom for us. But Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and 6, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What are you hungering after? I thought about when I was sitting in Sunday school class this morning, and I know that our, our lesson in the adult quarterly uh, concern worship and praise. But I, I thought about if you were called in to eat. And in the center of the table, there were two items. A bowl of spinach I one of these three or four layered coconut seven minute icing cakes. Which one would you choose? If the master of the house had said, you may choose either one, but you can't have both. What would you choose? Well, those who are health conscious may choose the spinach. Popeye would have. But then the flesh would say, oh, that, uh, and you may not like coconut cake, but uh, whatever you want to fill in the blank with, whatever cake that you like the most. The flesh would say, oh, I'm going for the cake. I can eat the spinach later. And I know sometimes when we have uh, some type of, of dinner or a fellowship here at the church that the dessert's on one table and the regular food on the other. And I've noticed that some people go to the dessert table first. And I don't suppose there's anything wrong with that, but uh, let's make a spiritual application here. The spinach representing spiritual things. The coconut layer cake representing the flesh, and the desires and lust of man. Now, which would it be? Well, Jesus had some things set before him, and he chose that bitter cup. You know, I don't have any problem with spinach. I especially like spinach dip. You, you know, you can doctor anything up. I, I remember Brother James Broom said, uh, gave advice to a young minister one time who was just starting out preaching, and uh, he asked Brother uh, James, said, what do you do when you go going home? They have things that you don't like to eat. He said, son, you can cover up a lot of stuff if you put enough ketchup on it. And so you may, you know, you may want to doctor up the spinach or 
turnip grains or collard grains or mustard grains, whatever. But nevertheless, that <clears throat> spiritual things are good for us. And it may seem as though that it's a bitter cup to swallow sometimes to go that spiritual route. To do those things that are not pleasing to the palate of man. To do those things that uh, are not uh, uh, really uh, what we want to do. But then if we will choose that spiritual way, God will give us that soundness of mind that we need. He gives us help in time of temptation to keep our minds sound. The first chapter of the book of James. Temptation is a very real thing, is it not? Can you remember as a child, and I think maybe I've mentioned this one time before that Sometimes when I was just a child, that I, I would go with my dad to town. And when you went to town, then it was downtown Mobile. And Sears Roebuck store had a big old candy counter right in the middle of their store on the first floor. And they knew that every kid that came in there, that'd be the first thing they'd see. And they want to go to that candy counter. And I love these, these big old uh, marshmallow peanuts, you know, that colored orange, I believe they are. Uh, and, and I love those things. And I'd always, you know, ask my dad if I could have some of those marshmallow peanuts when we went in Sears. And uh, so I imagine if they'd had a counter there with spinach and turnip greens and uh, peas and beans and all in it, not many children would have gone to that counter. But we're the children of God. And when he offers us spiritual food that's good for us, we need to eat it and not go after the lust of the flesh. But as I said in the book of James, we want to read in the first chapter in verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Did you get that? That endureth temptation. And don't think for one minute that if you're saved that you'll never be tempted. Jesus himself was tempted 40 days in the wilderness. For when he is tried, and that's the key to it, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Anything that tries our faith is temptation. What is it that tempts you? What is it that tempts me? We're all made subject to temptation. But he said that... <clears throat> He will receive a crown of life if he endures that temptation. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. Remember during the time of Jesus' temptation, and Satan came to him. And Jesus was hungry. He had not had anything to eat or drink for 40 days. And you say, a man couldn't live that long. The Son of God can and did. So Satan tempted him and he even tempted him to uh, turn those rocks into food and th that he could eat and so on. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Father. 
Satan tried every way he could to tempt Jesus, but Jesus quoted scripture to him. So Satan just went on and left him alone. You know how you can get Satan to go away and leave you alone and stop tempting you at that moment? Quote scripture to him. Tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. Old Slewfoot, you get on down the road. Leave me alone. I'm God's child. He goes on. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, don't think that because you experience the temptation of lust, that you're alone. Because probably just about every human being on planet Earth at one time or another has experienced that temptation. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. You have to act upon that lust in order for sin to be committed. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Paul said, for the wages of sin is death. But I'm thankful he didn't stop there. He said, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so the Lord gives us the strength and the courage to endure temptation. Then there's a matter of a, a pure life. And living a pure life will do what for us? It'll keep us close to God. And notice I didn't say a perfect life, I said a pure life. In Titus chapter 1, Paul speaks to this in his letter to Titus. And let's see what he had to say about it. You know, Paul sought to be a blessing not only to uh, the members of the churches that he pastored, not only to the, uh, those who uh, came to the mission services, but he sought to be a blessing to ministers who uh, were in his presence from time to time. And so in Titus chapter 1 in verses 15 and 16, Paul wrote this, under the pure... All things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. You don't have to listen to a man talk very long until you find out whether he's on the pure side or whether he's defiled and he's an unbeliever. His speech will betray his heart. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess they know God. But in works, they deny him. Yes, there are those who will profess to know God. And yet their works deny that they do. Being abominable. You know, there, there, there are certain things that are abomination to God. And it doesn't make it any difference who tries to change that. It's an undeniable truth. And those things that are abomination unto God, we as God's children need to leave them alone, do we not? That we might remain pure. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Paul made reference to uh, those who we're in this world and 
Maybe he had a desire to come to God in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans. And they had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That is, they had a desire to, to come to him, but they didn't know how. And there are people in this world who have no idea what the term salvation means. There are some right here in L.A., lower Alabama, who do not know what salvation is. And that's sad. And then there are those who maybe uh, were brought up in religion that uh, if they were baptized as an infant, that they think everything's okay. And that as long as they uh, go and confess their sins on a regular basis, that they're going to continue to be okay. And yet, the scripture te teaches us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Christ. The only way to come to God is through Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And a man cannot, man, woman, boy, girl, who, whoever, cannot have soundness of mind if they do not trust Jesus as their Savior. I'm talking about true soundness of mind. Then we need to have our mind stirred up occasionally by the word of God. In the third chapter of 2 Peter, Peter said that we're to have our pure mind stirred up by way of remembrance. Again, this word pure. And in the midst of the trouble and turmoil that people are experiencing today, there are many people who are walking around who do not enjoy soundness of mind. I want to read you a verse of scripture. Maybe it would help us to better understand that. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He doesn't want us as his children to be dominated by fear. He doesn't want us to be dominated by anxiety or worry. He wants us to have a sound mind. Now, the best way we can have a sound mind, and to go back to the original uh, Greek, it means a disciplined mind. A disciplined mind. We have our heart, our mind stayed are fixed on him. Well, Peter said, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You have a sound mind tonight. Is your faith completely and the Lord's ability to help you. Yes, there are going to be times when we're going to be challenged in many different ways. We're going to be challenged by Satan. Satan tried every tool at his disposal to bring down and destroy Job and get him to curse God. He was not able to do it. Job stood firm. Now there's some question marks concerning what all had happened to him, naturally. 
But never once did he lose his integrity. Never once did he charge God foolishly. He believed that God brought him into this world and that God would take him out of this world and his faith was going to remain in him. Job had soundness of mind. What a blessing. I heard a statement made the other day by one of our ministers. He said, I wonder how many of you today are a basket case. Well, we might could look at ourselves And say, am I a basket case? Or am I depending upon the Lord? To look to him for our strength, to help us to have that disciplined mind. But if we go after that coconut cake rather than the spinach, we're not going to have the soundness of mind that we need. Talk about using that for an example. If we go after the lust and desires of the flesh rather than the will of God for our lives, we're not going to have soundness of mind. There's no sin so great that God cannot forgive it. There's no problem so Tremendous that God can't solve it. There's no situation that's so dire that God cannot bring a resolution to it. My, what an awesome God we serve. Do we have soundness of mind as God's people? Then for just a few moments in closing, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I made a statement during the message tonight that you cannot truly have the soundness of mind that you need unless you know the Savior. I mentioned Job a while ago. The Lord had a hedge built around Job and Satan couldn't get in. And God removed the hedge for Satan to come and to try Job. But my friend, if you're lost, there is no hedge around you. There is no barrier. There is no wall around you. You're at the mercy of the God of this world. And that's Satan. You say, oh, I have a strong constitution and I have a good conscience and I know right from wrong and so on. Why do bad things happen to good people? But if you don't know the Savior, you do not have what you need to protect you in time of spiritual warfare. You know, this skirmish over in Israel and the Gaza Strip and so on. It may look maybe like a dire situation, but that's nothing in comparison with that spiritual warfare that we fight every day as children of God. And we're not fighting against the weapons of warfare that man has invented. We're fighting against unseen forces that we cannot see. And if you're lost, you're in a pitiful situation. You're in a dire situation. You need the Lord. And I'd be the first one to stand up and say in this congregation tonight, without him, I could do nothing. 
Without him, as the songwriter said, I'd surely fail. What about you? You know the Savior. You desire soundness of mind. You desire the peace of God which passes all understanding that can come into your heart, your innermost being, and feel that vacant space that's there. I've heard so many people down through the years say that I was searching for something that could fill a void within me, and, and I, I didn't even realize what the void was, but I knew there was something missing there. And when Jesus came into my heart, that vacant space was filled. And he can fill that longing of your soul. He can satisfy that thirsting of your soul. And you can feast upon the bread of life. Tonight, this is a serious matter. You know, Jesus, we're going to ask for a verse of an invitation hymn. Whatever be upon your heart, you come as we stand and sing.